Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome to another episode of the Heart Healthy Hustle podcast show. I'm your host, Jonathan Frederick, and I am glad you're here. On this show, I talk with industry-leading experts about connecting with others, impacting your niche, and striving to live the best life possible. It's all about sparking meaningful conversations around business ownership and entrepreneurship. The Heart Healthy Hustle Show is about finding connection with proactive peers and navigating a healthy work life with full autonomy. So whether you're driving to or from work right now, exercising, eating, or just relaxing, come hang out and get ready to enjoy another inspiring episode of the Heart Healthy Hustle Show. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Heart Healthy Hustle Show. I'm your host, Jonathan Frederick, and we are here today with a very special guest by the name of Chris Lytle. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jonathan. And if you Google Chris Lytle, you'll probably get the kickboxer first. But if you Google Chris Lytle sales, I'll come up pretty pretty fast. Wonderful. So Chris, he's conducted more than 2,200 seminars throughout the English-speaking world. Um, he's a gifted speaker, teacher. Chris inspired and educated countless radio advertising sales professionals for 44 years. He's famous for providing more usable information per minute than anyone else in the business. Chris is the author of the business bestsellers, The Accidental Salesperson, and The Accidental Sales Manager. His company, Instant Sales Training, continues to deliver his sales training in easy, digestible knowledge bites. Chris's mission is making successful people and companies even more successful. Chris, again, I've been anxiously awaiting the opportunity to talk to you. Very glad to have you. Nice to be here. Thanks. Go ahead and fill in any gaps from that intro that I may have missed. Give us a brief glimpse into your personal life. Well, I live in Chicago with my wife, Sarah McCann, and we have three cats. We never did have kids. We had two or three businesses over the years. We enjoy getting away from the business and vacation because we got a great team here. But Sarah has just started another business. She has a U.S. patent on a spray called the Crave Control Spray that helps people diet without discomfort. So we have another business called the Plan Z Diet. You've tried everything from Atkins to Weight Watchers. Try Plan Z. And we've got about 5,000 customers in that company. So I'm, I'm helping her with that business as well. Oh, that's fantastic. I, I have heard of Crave Spray. Was she on Shark Tank? No, she wasn't. We haven't done that yet. Okay. Yeah. It, it sounds like <laughs> something that I would have seen on there. We usually start out the show with a favorite success quote or a saying you live by. Um, one I do, I do want to share prior to asking you for yours will be, choose to become an expert. Become known for what you know and not just what you sell and watch your sales, customer retention and referrals go through the roof. And that was said by none other than Chris Lytle. So <laughs> do you have one that you also uh, enjoy on a daily and- basis? And I'm quoting, I was quoting from a guy I met on uh, a United flight who was retired. He told me the three secrets of success. I was thinking about this very hard and I, I love the term, I, I love shovel the piles when they're small. Mm. And, and that means if you've got a problem with a client or you've got any kind of problem with a relationship, deal with it before it becomes a raging forest fire or a giant pile. So shovel the piles when they're small. As I contemplated this interview, I remember Something my father told me, I was in the fourth grade. I was walking home from Johnny Clem Elementary School in Newark, Ohio, and my friend Steve Fetter said, hey, Chris, I got three A's on my report card, and I'm going to get 25 cents per A from my dad when I get to dinner tonight. I had 12 A's on my report card, so I at dinner, I said to my father, I said, you know, Steve's dad gives him a quarter for every A, and I think that's a great idea. And he said, Chris, son... You go to school to learn, and learning is the reward. Mm. You don't get rewarded for learning. Learning is the reward. And I remember every night my father would be reading. He'd read for an hour or two every night, and he just set that great example for me. My passion for lifelong learning really started with that statement. Learning is the reward. That's powerful. That's That reminds me a lot of something my father uh, instilled in me as well. When I was young, my friends were getting allowances and I was not. <laughs> my dad always laughed. He would say, you know, they're getting two bucks a week just for being alive and living. <laughs> so <laughs> back then, two bucks, it would get me a, a, a nice treat from the uh, corner store. He made me work instead. So I, I always appreciate that. Yeah, and, and the older I get, the more I, uh, I totally adopt that. You know, the, the learning is the, is the reward. Go ahead into a little bit about your story, your backstory. Uh, I know you have background in sales, of course, you're an expert in that field. And go ahead and share a bit with my audience how you got into that. Well, the short 
short story is that I graduated in from college in 1972. I was a congressional intern that summer. I was sending reports back to my radio station from I was go to the congressional broadcasting studio and tape a couple of little reports and send them back to air in Newark, Ohio at WCLT AM and FM. And when I got back from my internship, I walked into the radio station and said, uh, I'd love to have a job in the news department. And the general manager said, we don't need a newsman, Chris, but we could sure use a salesman. I said, but I'm a political science major. He said, well, that won't hold you back too much. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) you can obviously read and write and you have good people skills. So he put me on in in sales. And the story that I haven't told, I don't write about it in the book or, or anything, but he really saw some potential in me. The, uh, he's, he's passed away now, Bob Pricer. I'd known him from church, and I'd known him as a, he used to play Santa Claus and you know, when Santa Claus came to town. And so I'd, I'd known him all my life, and he saw something in me as a salesperson, and he sent me to the Radio Advertising Bureau's new school for salesmen. And it was, this was 1972, they didn't have salespeople back then. It was salesmen. He said, I'll pay for it. Five days, $550. But you have to pay the gas out to uh, Rutgers. It was, at, it was in New Jersey at Rutgers University. We were in class for... Back then, was that the Camden or the Brunswick? Brunswick. New Brunswick, right? Yes. Um, yep. So I went to New Brunswick and studied with maybe 20 or 25 other salespeople and station owners and really got immersed into what was called consultative selling, ask questions, solve problems. And I came back to Newark, Ohio with a complete philosophy of selling that I really didn't have. I read some books on it, but I really hadn't had the specific training. And I realized that they turned on the lights and given me a track to run on a path and a philosophy that that would really help me succeed. That's when I started loving the, the whole training industry but also, I, I, you know, I was 23 years old, 22 years old, and I really had to make my mark. And that was, I was able to make my mark because of that training. Mm, that's powerful that he believed in you and saw that in you back when, even though you were talking about political science, he, he <laughs> saw that in you. It, it was interesting because I thought I'd work my way into the news department and then I would go to Columbus, Ohio and get a TV anchor job. But the, the news director was driving a, a Chevy Vega that was eight or nine years old and the, the sales manager had a brand new Cadillac. And I think he traded that out with the Cadillac dealership every six or seven months. He'd have a new car. I said, maybe, you know, maybe sales is in, in the broadcast industry would be a good thing to stay in and get good at. So I was able to move to Madison, Wisconsin answered an ad in Broadcasting Magazine, which is now defunct. These guys flew me out and interviewed me and gave me the job in Madison, much bigger market. And later, within three years, I was a sales manager and they sold me some stock. And so I really got to hang around some some cool people. And I remember one day I was at the tennis club with my boss, Phil Fisher. Phil says, uh, Chris, I'd like you to meet a friend of mine. Oscar, this is Chris Lytle. Chris, this is Oscar Meyer. And Oscar Mayer headquarters was in Madison. And so I didn't hang around with Oscar Mayer, but I hung around with people that hung around with him. And I realized, uh, you know, here's how you make some money. Here's the guys I want to be around. So I was no longer around my high school friends. I was around people who were business owners and entrepreneurs. And you could see the work ethic. And then I, I, I started calling on American TV and furniture these, you know, these guys are working, they're opening a store at 10 and they're working, they're closing the store at nine and they're working seven days a week. And you just, you see people, you, you know, what it takes to really succeed. And so, you know, they made me their advertising director, I think in 1976. And I was with them as they grew from 8 million to 80 million. And I was buying all the advertising and salespeople were calling on me from like 162 different salespeople from around Wisconsin and Northern Illinois. I I really learned what good selling was, bad selling was as a buyer Mm. uh, because I was able to kind of grade salespeople who were calling on me. And and then I started my own training business and and specialized in, in radio and TV sales. Going into that a little bit back at that time. What was that transition like? I I assume being that you were proactive and everything that it was probably pretty natural for you to just enjoy it. Well, it was eye-opening. 
you could see the way they behaved, the, the, where they ate, the clubs they belonged to. And you got, I got to be a part of that and, and just see how they, their manners, the, the social graces. And my family is a middle class family and I was brought up well, but I wasn't around the, the kind of money and the kind of success that I was when I was was in Madison, and and part of that was I was alone. I mean, it was my first wife and me were. Uh, she w- she wanted to go to grad school there, so I got a job uh, in radio there. And there was no support system. It was just you hung out with the the people at the station. You played on the radio station basketball team and the softball team, and you started n- getting to know people. And your clients became your network. So I didn't have the old high school friends saying, "Hey, come on out and have a beer." Come on, I was I was working and and around people who were at work, and that was really helpful. I think for me to get out of the the town where I was born. For sure. So I'm extremely driven myself, Chris, and passionate about what I do. I mentioned in my emails to you, I have, I'm a door-to-door, I uh, work door-to-door sales currently on this mm-hmm. side. I have full autonomy in that job and I really enjoy it. I'm grateful for it. So interestingly, as I grow in self-awareness, uh, I find that being so driven and passionate about what I do in any area can be an automatic turnoff to new prospects, whether it be prospective clients, friendships, relationships. What advice do you have specifically for young men and women who are extremely focused and passionate? So maybe they're coming on a little too strong or something. I've been reading Anthony Iannarino's book, The Lost Art of Closing, and he talks about having an other focus instead of a a me focus. And so you, you have to be interested in the other person's success and the other person's problem instead of your own problem. I'll tell you a story. This is from my early career. I mentioned American TV and furniture, and I was calling on American TV as a radio advertising salesperson. And Lenny and I were, Lynn Mattioli and I were sitting at a dinette table in the furniture department, and I was trying to work on his ads for the next week's ad blitz. <laughs> He kept getting interrupted by his employees with a question, hey, can I give him this price? And and when he wasn't getting interrupted, he was making sure all the people in the store were waited on. And it took an hour for us to write a piece of 60-second copy. And I walked back into the to my boss's office and I said, that bleeping Matty Oli, I can't stand working with him. He wastes my time. And Phil said to me, that's your problem. And by the way, we don't talk about our customers like that. We don't swear, call them swear words. You're fired. Now, if you can come back tomorrow and tell me what Lenny's problem is, you can have your job back. I went home and I couldn't afford to be fired. (laughs) I had $500 maybe in the bank. And I started thinking, what's Lenny's problem? What's Lenny's problem? And I, I went, I was at the door of the store at 10 o'clock the next morning when they, the guys walked in. I said, Len, come over here. You got a problem. He said, what's my problem? I said, it took us an hour to create a 60-second commercial yesterday, and you're dealing with 12 other salespeople coming up with commercials. That's costing you 12 or 13 hours a week of your time where you could be selling furniture, appliances, stereos, TVs, and running your company. Mm. Why don't you let me handle all your advertising? I'll come to your house on Tuesday night. We, when the store closes, we can spend an hour and get everything done. Now you got 12 or 11 or 12 hours to work on your business. He said, how much would that cost? I said, and I wasn't even going to charge him. I said, why don't you just give me $1,000 worth of store credit every month? Oh, okay. That's fine. Deal. So I was handling uh, an advertising budget for the whole market in broadcasting because I, I quit worrying about my problem and started thinking about the client's problem. So that's the, the, the and so n- new salespeople tend to have this self-focus. I, I got the problem, I gotta, I gotta sell to make some money. When you start worrying about the prospect's problem and not your own, things get really easy. So the, tr- just be passionate, s- still be passionate, be, but be passionate about your prospects instead of your own success. Mm, that's powerful, especially, it, you know, getting into uh, just starting out in your career. It can be very easy to fall into the trap of like an egocentric view of your career. Like, oh, how am I doing? How <laughs> how am I coming across? Blah, blah, blah. And yeah. Re- reality. Yeah, exactly. Just looking from the other person's perspective, connecting with them on a personal level, identifying their problem. I love that you said at the time it was your manager who said that to you about your yeah. 
Yeah, I love that because every time I feel negativity coming on, it's just creeping up on me. Wait a minute here. This is my issue. 100% responsibility <laughs> on me. And I try to identify that. And sometimes it still can be difficult, but I try to avoid that uh, cynical outlook. Well, it's, it's really an interesting issue. Running your brain is one of the hardest things in the world to do. One of my influences, I never met him, uh, the Larry Wilson, who wrote the one minute salesperson and many other. He was really the inventor of consultative selling. But I heard him make a speech one time and it's probably still on YouTube. But he said, most people don't think about what they think about. They think about what happened and they think about how they feel. Yeah. But they don't connect. They think what happened makes them feel the way they feel. But it's really not. It's, it's what you think about what happened what your brain is telling you about what happened. And last summer, Sarah and I were driving to a, a vacation in Michigan. And it's, it's a two hour trip to this place we'd rented. We had three cats in the back seat because <laughs> we rented a place where we could take our cats. And we're just chugging along and it, we're an hour into the trip, maybe an hour and 15 minutes and bam, we hit this pothole. And I mean, it was a monster pothole on I-94 and I could just, you could just watch on the dashboard, the fuel or the air gauge just go from 30 to 20 to, to nine to zero. First thing I said to her was, well, that's inconvenient because I, I could have said, well, this, that ruins the first day of our vacation because hmm. we had a flat tire. This is terrible. But I said, that's inconvenient, and it changed the way I, f I felt about the event. I can't change the event. I can only change the way I think about the event. And then uh, all of a sudden, I don't feel so terrible. Turns out if you have a Cadillac ATS, you can drive another 50 miles. And we found out where the dealership was. We, we drove into the dealership on the flat tire. It's $175 for a new tire. But still, all that is is inconvenient. What would be terrible is if we hit a pothole and went off the road and killed two cats and injured ourselves. But having a flat tire is inconvenient. And having somebody reject you or hang up on you is not a disaster. It's inconvenient. It's, it's the way you think about what happens instead of what happens. Identifying the fact you can't change it and moving forward. So Chris, Absolutely. you are the author of a couple books, The Accidental Salesperson and The Accidental Sales Manager. You got another one coming out very soon. And with The Accidental Salesperson, you talk about selling on purpose and identifying if you are an accidental salesperson to identify and accept it and fully accept it to the point where you can then begin selling on purpose. That is probably the best advice I have ever read in terms of any kind of sales training because when you are in a position where you are an accidental salesperson and your <laughs> financial livelihood depends on your sales. It really helps to accept it and to actually start selling on purpose. So I genuinely will be walking around and I will say to myself, whether out loud or subconsciously throughout the day, sell on purpose. Before I knock on a door, I'm like, sell on purpose. While I'm speaking with people, I'm like, sell on purpose. Like if you're not going to be in this, then don't do it. Do it or don't do it. Identifying that and realizing that it's actually an incredibly difficult field to be in. It's something that really helped me to move past a lot of my initial barriers, still learning and growing every day. But the initial jump into sales is very difficult, especially if you didn't see yourself there. I was going to be uh, in physical therapy and my GPA wasn't high enough coming out of undergrad. So I had to change course and that's what I did. And at first I was a little discouraged, but like you said, it's an inconvenience. And then what do you do? You, <laughs> I, you adapt. And actually I found that I love the autonomy of working in sales and I love so many other things about it. Yeah. So you know, I, th I think the selling on purpose and having a mission, I always tell people, why are you doing this besides the money? Because if you can, if you can get a ho around that, you get, get your head around that what's the mission instead of what's the goal? Yeah, go into because, that a little bit for, for my audience, the, the why, yeah, if you would. Well, you know, Simon Sinek has made a fortune on the, you know, start with why. Yeah. Uh, but w why are you doing this besides the money? And what are you getting out of the job besides a, ch a paycheck? I, I think the contribution that we make is to people's lives with what we sell and what we do. And of course, I've sold seminars for... 35 years now. And I, I, 
I think of the times when I'm dragging around airports and, and you know, why am I, why do, where am I going tonight and where am I going to wake up? And I go, I got to do six hours tomorrow. And then I start to, I said, well, no, you get to do six hours tomorrow. Mm. Uh, you get to do six hours. And when, then when somebody comes up to me and says, you know, Mr. Lytle, thank you for my career. I said, well, how do you mean that? And she said, well, I, I had my resignation letter in my glove compartment when I came to your seminar last year when you were here. And uh, since my, my boss was going to send me to some training, I thought, well, I'm not going to quit till after I get the training. But after your seminar, I tore up my resignation letter because I knew based on what I learned at your seminar that I could succeed. You gave me some uh, a sales process. You gave me some, some ideas about selling advertising. And I just went back and doubled my income uh, next, the, since the last time you were here. And I just want to thank you for my career. And, and whenever I start to feel bad, I just remember that story, which still, uh, you know, almost brings a tear to my eye. I've spent the money that I earned at that seminar a long time ago, but I still have the story. And that's what keeps me going but because I've been able to contribute to people's success. And I still hear from people that I trained 20 and 25 years ago. That long-term outlook, that's very important to have, I believe, even being young. Income from the seminar is spent now, but that story sticks with you and it kind of contributes to your why. It's beautiful. So yep. with the accidental salesperson specifically, uh, what was your favorite chapter or story to write about <laughs> in your book? Well, I, I love chapter five, which is quit making sales calls. That story came about because I was doing some consulting for a company and that had some sales problems. And the sales manager said, I've got people making 10 calls a day and we're not making goal. Do you think I should have them make more calls? And I said, well, let me look at some of the call reports first before I, t uh, let, me, let me do a little research. And he gave me a stack of call reports. And the third call report I read was, uh, this guy said, he, I called on this company. Uh, Ed was having lunch with another vendor. I'll call back next Tuesday. So there was a three sentence report on a meeting that never occurred. I went to call on a guy who was not there and I wrote three sentences about it. And I said to the salesperson, why, do you, why did you write this up? Nothing happened. He said, everything I do, I write up because we gotta make 10 calls a day. I said, so, and so if you dial the phone and get a busy signal, yep, that's a call. You dial the wrong number, yep, that's a call. So what they were calling sales calls were not getting them anywhere because they were just worried about quantity, not quality. Mm. So I came up with the term scheduled sales conversation instead of call or SSC. Do you have a scheduled sales conversation? Now, if you're working a, a B2B job, it's different than if you're working a door-to-door -door job or a B2C, you know, B2C. But a B2B where you're making appointments and it may take three or four meetings to, to make a sale, you need to have the next meeting scheduled rather than trying to chase people down for the next step. The magic phrase, are you willing to work with me on a calendar basis, is a way to see if you really have a prospect who's going to engage with you or you have an information seeker who says, oh yeah, I'm interested, give me a call next week. And you give them a call next week and they're not around. Mm -hmm. So working on a calendar basis, having a scheduled sales conversation is something that I've been teaching for the last 10 or 11 years, people who, who ask that question, are you willing to work with me on a calendar basis? will have much more, will have a much more pristine pipeline than somebody who's got a bunch of information seekers in the pipeline. Yeah. Like tire kickers, so to speak, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I love that word picture. <laughs> I just picture him kicking at the tires. I'm like, Hey, my tires, uh, they're, they're old enough. Leave them alone. It's been about 17 years since that one was released, right? Do you still receive income from it in any form? The reason I ask this is because it's very fascinating to me creating like passive streams. Do you think writing a book and long-term, would that be a viable source of income? Yeah. I wish I was Stephen King. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, so you, you get an advance, you get a little advance to write it. You spend a lot of time writing it, which you, you never, you never get paid for writing it. Yeah. Every, every six months I get a check and it can be these days. I mean, it used to be three or 4,000 every quarter, every, every six months. And, you know, now it's uh, 900. Uh, and I, I still get residuals from the accidental sales manager. So yeah, it's great. It's fun to get that. It's fun to get the residual checks. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, and, that's, 
your and work is working for you instead of you working for it. Basically making your dollars an employee for you. Mm-hmm. Love that. Yeah, so 100% commission-based sales, that's what I'm working in, but that that's that can be a lucrative career option, right? But how do you stay focused and undiscouraged when you do everything right but still don't hit your goals, especially being proactive, goal-oriented, focused? Let's say you do everything right and there's always room for improvement, always where can I improve, what, what can I do to accept more responsibility in this situation, identifying my prospects' issues. But it's easy to become discouraged even still. So that can be kind of the beginning of the end if, if you're not careful. So how do you stay focused and undiscouraged? Well, I think you have to give yourself permission to fail and learn and know that there's no such thing as an overnight success. I think the trouble with most salespeople is you compare yourself to highly successful people who've been working at something for 10, 15, 20 years, and you don't see all the failures and all the problems they've had to get to where they are. You don't see their backstory. Especially with millennials, you want success more quickly than success is possible. And you're you're frustrated sometimes when it doesn't come so quickly. But it takes it takes two or three years to really get good at something. And so you've got to give yourself the time. And I, I, I know, and part of, it, part of it's the way you grade yourself. I was a very good student and I was an honor society guy and I get into sales and I'm failing 60, 70% of the time. I'm not closing, I'm not doing well. And I get frustrated and I said to somebody, I'm just not doing it. And I, I, I wish I remember who said this to me, but he said, Chris, this is sales. In sales, 30% is an A. 40% is an A+. Plus. In school, it's 95% is an A. And, and you're comparing how you're doing in sales with how you did in school. And so you've got to be happy. 25% is a B+, plus, hmm. 30%, 40%. And so you can't beat yourself up. Sales is a series of defeats punctuated by profitable victories. That was in the Wall Street Journal at one point. And you have to understand that the defeat is part of the process and people who are willing to put up with that. Part of that is the way you talk to yourself about closing and not closing. I was fortunate enough to see a a guy, the late great Alan Simberg. He was a professional speaker until he was in his 90s. I saw him at a conference and he said, if you walk into a place with nothing, and you walk out of a place with nothing, you didn't lose, you broke even. So not closing is breaking even. Not asking is losing. If you really believe that, then you won't feel so defeated when you don't make the sale. Closing certainly is winning, but not closing is breaking even. It's not losing, it's not, the more personally you take it, the more you beat yourself up. Totally. Another thing I love about the accidental salesperson going back 17 years or so, um, is how you talked about that, being okay with those losses. And that's really good to remember, even if you're a freelancer, small business owner, looking for people to serve, that's just something to keep in mind. You don't have to, everyone you talk to is not going to, it might be a no, and it might just be a no for now too. So it's it's never personal. That's something I love about the book you mentioned. It's your system. Have a system to implement. <laughs> So that system is rejected. It's never about you. They don't know you. Yeah. Um, even if they do know you, it's still, it's about the way it went down. It's not even about you, even the service you're offering. So Chris, um, let's go ahead and jump into the Heart Healthy Hustle round. I'm going to ask you a series of rapid fire questions. Are you ready for the Heart Healthy Hustle round? Of course uh, I'm ready. All right. Awesome, Chris. So the first topic of this Heart Healthy Hustle round is a heart. So what's your favorite activity for caring for yourself and strengthening your uh, internal character? Well, for caring for myself, for me, it's reading things that I haven't read before in in fields that I haven't read before. So I'm fascinated by science. I'm fascinated by nutrition. I'm fascinated by history. I I listen to the great courses on my uh, Audible. Uh, So I want to keep learning in fields that I really didn't study before so that I don't get stuck in one pattern of thinking and don't watch too much Morning Joe or Fox News and just get those opinions. I think that is important. And I think reconnecting with old friends is important and and taking the time to have, have conversations with them and just see where they're at in their journey because the, we need that human connection. Uh, I can't just spend time reading and listening to books. 
Love that. For health, how do you maintain your physical health? Well, I'm done with sugar. I'm off of most breads and glutens. Quit running and beating my, my knees and hips up. But I discovered 11 years ago, uh, super slow weight training. Jonathan, have you ever heard of super slow weight training? Yes, I definitely have. You know, it's high intensity. Uh, trainer is making sure everything is perfect form. You, I do seven exercises a week with a trainer, usually for two minutes each until you fail. And then you hold that, hold the pose for another 10 seconds to enroad the, uh, or the, the exercise. But the philosophy of super slow is you only grow muscle while you're resting. And if you can, if you can really break down the muscle to failure once a week is all you really need to exercise in 22 minutes is the, is the time. So in the old days, I would run an hour a day and, or jump rope for 35 minutes and, and everything hurt. And now I'm 67 years old, no aches and pains, no prescription drugs, and uh, feel as strong as I've ever felt in my life. And I was an all-American high jumper in college. So oh, wow. I'm, actually, I'm, I'm stronger today than I was when I was a senior in college. That's fantastic. I was a pole vaulter. All right. Yeah, I loved, uh, loved track and field. I was not yeah. an All-American, but that's I was, awesome. I was, a college, I was a college division All-American. That was 1971, which there were, they, they didn't have Division One, Two, II, and Three. They had university division and college division. So Do you remember your, a, your highest jump? Yeah, six feet, eight inches. That was the women's world record in 1971. Right on. <laughs> That's great. So the ir- irony in from what I picked up on your super slow weight training is that it's super slow, right? But it's it's highly effective and actually quite efficient. Safe and efficient. I'm not training for any any big sports anymore. I want to be able to get out of a chair when I'm 90 with without having one of those chairs that boost you out. I want to maintain my muscle mass and bone density. And uh, there, there's really, when you do this workout, you're gassed. I mean, I've had, I could, there's times when I can, can't can lift up a cup of water because my hand is shaking so much. But you do recover fairly quickly, and I've done it 11 years now. So it's really the best thing I've ever found. The other thing I do, you know, I, I really watch my diet in terms of carbs. I don't eat a lot of sugar, and most every morning I make some kind of a smoothie with the superfoods in it, uh, hemp hearts and flaxseed and protein powder. And today I put some maca and some cacao in it and a little bit of stevia, uh, maybe five or six pieces of, or berries, and then blend that up. And that's my breakfast. So I really, and then a lot of fish oil and uh, multiple vitamins. So, uh, you know, that's, that's how I take care of myself. That's great. So for the smoothies, a lot of times people are like, oh, that's gross. You know, it's like you're drinking motor oil. The reality is when you start to look at what's actually in foods, the stuff that tastes good, and the reality is that a green super fuel is what's going to give you the clarity of mind and brain and clear you out and just keep you feeling high energy all day. Um, so for hustle, what is your main motivation for hustling to the max of your potential? I mean, you're, you say you're 67 years old. You're still, you're still working. You, you got a, a new book coming out. What's keeping you motivated, Chris? Well, I think it's still making a contribution. And I think what I want is for people to still want my opinion and to still make a contribution to the industry that I serve. Whereas I used to do 136 hour seminars a year, I, I now do one or two a month. And I love to be in front of an audience, but I don't need the grind. So now with this instant sales training website, I've made the, you know, the, They've got a web course that I that I sell and coach, uh, so people can get 30 lessons in 30 days rather than have me stand there for six hours and tell people everything I know. So I started time releasing my sales training in the 90s, just using a binder, uh, and then we put everything online. So for me, it's exciting to adapt to the changes and not just lament the fact that oh I, I don't get to go on stage anymore. I, I know I know I get to stay home and reach a thousand people with you know with a five minute knowledge bite and I can do that every week and reach people you know reach people week after week and enhance their learning and I don't have to be there so distance learning is great um, as long as you get to go face to face once in a while right go ahead Chris share with us your three most influential books and why that is such a tough question you if you only knew 
how many books I've read and, and how much influence they've had on me. I started thinking, I want to I want to tell you the book that I'm reading today that everybody should read as soon as possible. It's Rob Lustig, Dr. Robert Lustig's book, The Hacking of the American Mind, is absolutely the most lucid, compelling book on what the corporations have done with food engineering to make us crave it and to get the dopamine in our brain going when we eat something and make us crave more. It's what the, uh, you know, getting addicted to Facebook likes and, and we just, people are walking around with their phone all day long and how the, our mind has been sort of hijacked, whether it's by gambling or the internet, to get these dopamine rushes versus which we call pleasure, but he makes the point that pleasure and happiness are not the same. And we've conflated pleasure and happiness. Happiness is serotonin, which is, you know, the other hormone. So your serotonin levels are up. You feel content and happy. And you can't buy happiness. You can only buy pleasure. So it's heavy and it's, it's amazing. And if you, if you can't read the book or don't read, he's, he's got some YouTube videos on it that are just mind-blowing. So there's that. And then the other thing that I've been reading for health is, and, and for my wife's diet business is The Case Against Sugar, Gary Taubes, who also wrote Good Calories, Bad Calories, and Why We Get Fat, amazing stuff. And, and then I would go back and say, I, I also benefited a lot from Jim Rohn, so uh, if you want to check out some of those things. So it, it's, it's uh, I'm sorry I couldn't come up with just one. But, no, that's uh, fine. Yeah, I appreciate the. Uh, yeah, I'm very interested in the, the the hacking of the American mind. That's something the uh, manipulation of hormone levels with novelties is very fascinating to me. It's happening. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and every time I pass somebody on the road, even if they're out walking outside, a lot of times you'll see one hand's got a phone in it. The other hand might be walking the dog, but one hand's got a phone at the ready. It's kind of spooky. Yep. So, if you had 60 seconds with your 20, let's say 25 year old self, what would you tell them to do? What would you tell him not to do? I would I would tell him not to hire friends <laughs> hmm. because you'll they won't be great workers and then they won't be great friends. Uh, I made that mistake too many times, but but otherwise I would just say you can't imagine what's going to happen, the changes that will occur in your lifetime, and. You, you've got to be ready to abandon what's working, you know, destroy your successes, your successful model, and adapt to the new way of doing things. Because uh, you know, you went to college, and, and I'll never forget my the, the first, I don't remember a lot of the things that I learned in college, but I remember that the president of the college spoke at the freshman convocation, and my mom and dad were with me, and I was sitting there. And his name was Dr. A.B. Bonds. And he said, this is not a technical school. You're not here to learn a trade. You're here to learn how to learn. Because most of you in this room will not only have eight, nine, ten jobs, you'll have four or five or six different careers. You have no idea what's going to happen to the job that you have now. And I was sitting there with my dad who'd worked at the same company for 25 years. And he was an executive and a purchasing guy and, and a vice president. And within, within six years, his company had closed and, and he had three more jobs before his uh, career ended. So, you know, you'll have multiple careers, multiple jobs, and all you really need to be able to do is learn how to learn. Mm, that's powerful. Just letting that soak in. <laughs> He was so right. He was so right. Going into that a little bit, a lot of people who are impatient, maybe young people are like, yeah, you know, I have a small business. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Let's say they have their head on right. They don't even care about image. They're just doing the, they're perfecting their craft. They're practicing, they're learning, they're serving people. They're getting out there. A lot of times you could still get stuck on, oh, well, it's, you know, it's working now. What does it look like 10 years down the road, right? It's going to be different for everybody, of course, but what are some things to be on the lookout for as time passes that will be markers or triggers that should forewarn them, hey, you know, get ready to adapt or you're going to not make it or you should adapt if you want to. What are some of those markers? 
Well, I, I can tell you for me, it was you're, you're going along and you're doing 130 seminars a year and 9-11 occurs and people don't want to fly to meetings and meetings get smaller and you're not being booked as much as a speaker. Well, then you, you still have, I still had content. I still had ideas. I still had, all I had to do was convert that to an online product. If I wasn't flying to, to seminars, I could take the same content and sell it uh, as a course. So that changed my business model. I mean, one of the things that changed my business model was we, we won a contract to do training for a trade association in Canada, and I couldn't go up and do seminars in Canada because of, of the, they had to, they used to have uh, uh, laws about that. So we put everything we had in a binder before the internet, started training people with cassettes and, and binder courses. And, and that all of a sudden, instead of 90% of my, my, my business being speaking, 80% of my business was publishing. And it was more lucrative. It was easier on me. It was, you could reach more people. Uh, so it's, it's being flexible and being willing to change before somebody makes you change. And, and staying, staying ahead of the trends and keep learning about what's going on because technology changes. I mean, the internet just changed every business. And I, I think about my wife's business and, it, you know, it's, a, it's an internet business. We have a thousand recipes online for our, for our dieters and we don't have to have a cookbook. Uh, we, they buy the diet online and we deliver it, you know, we deliver it in a package with a manual we, e- we email their coaching and, and help them uh, change their lives. So it, you don't have to have a storefront. You can have a, a hundred or a thousand square foot office and two employees and, and have a pretty nice business now. You don't need 30, you know, 28 employees. It was just a lot of payroll. Now with the internet, you can really have a lovely business without the same hassles of, of having huge payrolls and uh, giant you know, rents. I've had, I've done that. So be willing to adapt because you you either have to be willing or you will be crushed by change. Awesome. That's really helpful. Thank you. What's a number one tip that you can give to aggregate online cus- customers, right? So you said like your wife's business is mostly online. What's something that a tip that you can provide somebody for gathering up a customer base online? Well, we cheat a little bit because I barter some of my training to radio stations for radio advertising and we put the local DJ on the diet who starts talking about it and then we create leads that way. But we're also working with a company to put ads where where people who are interested in dieting or weight loss will see them and then get them to sign up for a mailing list and then have a good autoresponder program, a MailChimp or a uh, AWeber or whatever, you know, constant contact. And nurture those clients, of course. Uh, And and we're, you know, the other day, I think we're converting about uh, 14% of our new mailing list clients into customers. But you've got to nurture them and have a way to get them. So we're not very successful with uh, Google ads, Google words, but we're successful with Facebook and then some radio advertising. Wonderful. So this is a question that I am sure some of my audience is curious about. I know I am. You, you're about, you said you're about 67 years old currently, right? Yep. Okay. So when you say things like AWeber or MailChimp um, to some of your successful peers that are, you know, maybe <laughs> 70 plus years old, do you ever get like weird huh? looks or like, what are you talking about? Or do most people at that level have already adapted and completely know what you're talking about? Or is it kind of a mixture of both? I don't, I don't think everybody does. And I think some of my friends are, are retired and completely happy to just uh, go play golf or do something else. But to me, and this, this is another thing that I, I think is the most powerful thing I've heard or read, and, and I'll go back to this, is Michael Kinsley's book is called uh, Old Age, a, U- a User's Manual. One of the things he said was, I'm a baby boomer, and the, the baby boomers used to say, whoever dies with the most toys wins. I don't know if you ever heard that one. Oh, yeah, many times. Whoever dies with the most toys wins. But Michael Kinsley said, really, as you get to, to this age, it's whoever dies with the most marbles wins. In other words, I don't have a company jet, but if I, can, if I don't get Alzheimer's or dementia and I can, I can still read and think and you know, write when I'm 80 or 90, 
I win. I don't need all the toys and all the accoutrements. In fact, um, last year, we we were living in an 8,000-square-foot converted auto repair shop with a barrel vaulted ceiling and an 80-foot skylight and offices at one end and our home on the other end. It's a magnificent building with the, the architect had fixed up, but we just decided to downsize and moved into a 1,300 square foot apartment and then built a 1,000 square foot office. And it's one of the most, I'm just it's calming. It's just to not to be striving for bigger and more, but to be satisfied and curate, you know, curate all your stuff and got rid of about 70% of our stuff, mm. but, but kept the stuff that really meant something. And so whenever, everywhere I look, there's a, a picture or a piece of furniture that's meaningful instead of five crock pots and, and 17 sets of dishes and, and four sets of silver. It's the stuff that we really, that, that's meaningful. And now, you know, we can spend a month in France or we can spend six months in France and not have a big house and, and things to worry about. So it, it, you know, part of it is striving, but also part of it is not striving to keep up with everybody, keep mm. up with your own values. It's important to uh, kind of just live in contentment. I've also adopted some of that minimizing <laughs> mindset, right? It's where getting rid of some things. Um, wonderful, Chris. I really appreciate all of that. That's very helpful and insightful. Uh, what's a project that you've been working on recently uh, that you're excited about? I know you have this book coming out, The 23 Shockingly Simple Sales Ideas. Yeah, it's for sale, for sellers, startups, and small businesses. It's a compilation of some of the scripts from my instant sales training website audios that I've really punched up and elaborated on. But really, it's 23 ideas. And the idea of the book is that you can read one idea in the morning or read one in the car, you know, after you're stopped, or read one at at night. And you'll always have one of these ideas at the ready when you're with a client. So sometimes something will pop out of your mouth that just works. I'll tell you one more story from the, if you got time, I'll, I'll tell you this. I was making a, a presentation on about sales training to a C, CFO, chief financial officer of a broadcast group, and I'd driven about 75 miles to make this call and have the meeting. And I'm trying to sell my sales training product, and he said, "You know, Chris, we just can't, we just can't find good people. So talking about training right now is just not really helping." And I happened to sell this. Uh, achiever profile test so you could find people who had the potential to sell. And so I said, you know, you know, you might want to consider this pre-employment testing service I have. And I explained it and he said, boy, that's exactly what we need. Write, write a proposal for me. Now this is a hundred dollar item. He, he needs about 15 of them. I said to him, I brought an order form. What do you mean? I said, well, when's your next interview? He said, well, we, we're going to interview someone tomorrow. I said, you don't need a proposal. You need an order form so we can get these to you. He said, yeah, that'll work. <laughs> and so that's the I brought an order form close. Sometimes people want you to write a proposal to get rid of you. And if you really, if they really want to buy, an order form is maybe all you need. That's awesome. So instantsalestraining.com, how can my audience connect with you and learn more about what you're doing? My email is chris.lytle, L-Y-T-L-E, at instantsalestraining.com. And if you, if you just put instant sales training into your browser, you'll get there. There's, some free, there's a free sample and there's a, a video on there you can look at. And uh, I'll give you a, a promo code. I typically sell this for $143 per sales manager person. But if you use the word shock at checkout, shock because i'm promoting shockingly simple sales ideas you'll get about half price of that so i think it's 77 dollars instead of uh, 143 so that that'll be for your listeners awesome chris we really appreciate that thank you very much my pleasure also you what's a way that we can find some of the crave spray because i know some people are very curious about that at this point yeah it's, it's called it's called zr50 crave control spray you can use it for 50 days and in, in part of this plan z diet so go to, you know, go to planzdiet.com and there's a little five minute video that explains the whole process. 
All right, great. All right, Chris, really enjoyed having you on the show. Thank you for all of the insight, wisdom, and knowledge that you've shared with my audience today. I know it's definitely contributed to a lot of people's careers and their walk in life. So thanks again. Jonathan, my pleasure. Keep doing it better. Your clients get better as you get better. Love it. All right. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Heart Healthy Hustle podcast. If you made it to the end of this episode, I want to say thank you. And also, I want you to ask yourself why. What about this episode really stood out to you? I want to challenge you to take action on that thing. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate your time and consideration to go ahead and leave a helpful review in iTunes. So it really helps the podcast grow and we can impact even more people who need this. Thank you guys for all of your support and I will see you in the next episode. Yeah.